So I've got here a preserved sheep's brain. Uh, we'll buy these from Blades. And uh, I'm going to give you a guided tour of how to dissect one and get the most out of one. I'm wearing gloves because um, I'm not terribly keen on the preservative of these, in these things. Even so, I must remember at the end of it to wash my hands. Uh, so I'm just going to cut into the package. Um, it's important to remind your students that we're using this sheep's brain as a model of the human brain. It's not going to be exactly the same. There's some really obvious things. It's much smaller to start with. And there are some less obvious things that we'll see as we go through it. These preserved brains are fairly dense. The preservative dries them out a bit and makes them a bit more solid, makes them much more easy to dissect. This is a precious piece of material. They cost about £12 each, so they're a bit of an investment for your classroom. But also, it's worth reminding the learners that um, this was fairly recently in a living animal, and it's worth just taking a moment to think about that. And if this was a human brain, if indeed if this was your own brain, um, it's, it's a little miracle, really, because somewhere in there is the thing you think of as you. And it's just worth just a moment's reflection on that. It's covered in the meninges, the uh, membranes that cover the brain. And you can see some blood vessels um, underneath those. You can see these dark tracts of blood um, supplying the brain. It's a fairly blood-hungry organ. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is get these meninges out of the way cut them off they're quite tough um, so I'm going to cut through those and just remove them a good sharp pair of scissors does quite well they are quite tough I'm just going to cut right through peel them away I'm going to be careful at the bottom of the brain because there's quite a lot of detail there that I don't want to disrupt So we've got the two cerebral hemispheres here. This would be the front end of the sheep, back of its head, and this is the rear end, or top of its head. This is the rear end of the sheep over here. And uh, this is going down to the spinal cord. So in a human, that would be pointing down, and the, the face of the person would be here. Um, I'm just going to turn it over and look at the base of the brain here. And you can see quite nicely, I'll take that bit away, um, here you've got two optic nerves. Um, so you've got one optic nerve there, one optic nerve there, they'll be going to the two eyes. And here you've got the point at which those optic nerves cross over so that the right visual field from both eyes goes to the left hemisphere and vice versa. Um, and Usually you don't see the pituitary gland, um, but that might be it actually. They're quite hard to get out of the skull. I think in this case we might have some. Um, might be there. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do next is cut this brain in half um, and... Um, we're going to look at the anatomy of the, of the brain um, on one half and I'm going to do some things with the other half of the brain. Actually, I've forgotten to show you one thing. At the back here, still covered in membranes, we've got the cerebellum, um, which is under there, and then that's leading to the, through the medulla oblongata um, out into the spinal cord out this way. You'll see quite a nice section of spinal cord there, top of the spinal column. All right, so I'm going to cut the brain in two now. So I'm going to make a vertical section. My scalpel, my sharp scalpel. Cut down that central line. Just keep going till I'm right through. Now I'm going to turn it round and I'm going to cut the back part of it. through those rather tough membranes. Thank 
keep going. Right, now I can see a bit deeper, I can cut more easily. Straight through those structures. Zoned up nicely. And I'm just going to cut through the membranes at the bottom with a pair of scissors. Now, if you were being economical with your students in class, what you might now do, uh, if, you were get, if you were allowing them a chance to do the brain dissections themselves, you could um, give each pair one half and they can all do the same thing. I'm going to do slightly different things with the two halves of this brain. So on this half of the brain, I'm going to do an anatomical dissection. I'm going to get rid of the remaining membranes that are around here now. Just carefully pull them away. I find it easier to do that with these membranes after I've cut the brain into two. Okay, I'm cutting through one of the cranial nerves there, which is probably the auditory nerve. Just there. And that's the optic nerve. bit of optic nerve that's come away with that. Okay. So, again, you can see the, um, uh, the outside here. We ought to talk about the lobes that you can see. So the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and temporal lobe, the cerebellum, the uh, spinal cord, medulla oblongata, going into the midbrain that you can see on the outside there. You can see all the folding and so on. Turn it over and now I'll start to look at the inside. So here's the spinal cord coming up. It comes into this region here. This is the medulla oblongata. You can see the fairly white material there. Um, that's the area, area where the, um, the tracts of nerve fibres are crossing over from one side to the other. You'll know and your students will know that the right side of the brain concerned with the left hand side of the body and vice versa so this is the region where the crossover occurs so that things go to the correct side here we've got the cerebellum the cerebellum is concerned with movement and it's like the autopilot really of your brain so you can initiate a movement like walking or picking something up um, consciously but you don't have to think about every muscle movement and so on that you need to do to make that movement take place. Your cerebellum will do that for you. Um, so it makes those movements automatic. You learn to do that fairly early on. And this region here is the pons. And the pons is where the two sides, tracks from the two sides of the cerebellum cross over to integrate movement between the side, two sides of the body. So, um, so that's the division there between cerebellum and the forebrain. Let's separate those. Um, this is, this is midbrain here, and then you're into forebrain. And what you can see fairly clearly here is a big tract of white material, white matter, around here. That's the corpus callosum, which connects the two cerebral hemispheres together. And then here you've got the cerebral hemispheres. Uh, if you dig into the corpus callosum underneath it there, you'll find a space. That's one of the ventricles of the brain. And in that space, in this region here, you're looking at the thalamus. So there you've got thalamus. And on this brain, we did have, I believe, have I left it behind here? Yeah, I did. I left it behind on this side. We've got some pituitary gland there. 
it probably came away. Yeah, it did. It came away on this side with the meninges. On the outside of the brain, worth reminding your students of the equivalent um, uh, lobes of the cerebral hemisphere. So you've got frontal lobe here, parietal lobe here, occipital lobe at the back, and temporal lobe would be in this region here. They ought to be able to recognise those. So that's a uh, vertical section through the brain. Uh, we could also look at some other sections. So you could do a, a sagittal section through the brain, which is to make this kind of cut. And what you'll see when you see the cut end there is the grey matter around the outside of the cerebral hemispheres and the tracts of white matter coming away from the grey matter and they're leading into this structure here, which we mentioned, the corpus callosum, to connect the two sides of the brain together and, and go forth from there. And then down in this region, there's some more grey matter. These are the basal ganglia, things like the amygdala, for example, down in this part of the brain. And you could also do a horizontal section Uh, here's a horizontal section through the cerebral hemisphere. And again, you can see the similar sorts of, sort of pattern. Uh, the the grey matter, white matter, basal regions here. Put that together and you can see there's a really complex 3D structure to the brain here. OK, that's a simple anatomical dissection of one half of the brain. What I'm going to talk to you about on the other half of the brain that I've got here is some other things you can do. You might want to share the halves of the brain out between groups in your class so they can all have a go at identifying the parts. But there are other things you could do as well. So imagine, for example, that you didn't know anything about how the brain works um, and you've got one here to look at. What conclusions might you draw about how a brain works? So that's a how science works or how psychology works approach to it. And they ought to be able to come up with several observations. The first is the simple observation that it's not uniform in structure and therefore that suggests that different parts of the brain probably do different things. So you've got evidence for localization of function because there are clearly different regions of the brain and might conclude that they do different things. If you looked at the optic chiasm at the bottom, so here's the optic nerve coming in and the chiasm was here, then that might also suggest that you've got some lateralization of function, um, particularly because you've, got the, uh, you've also got the fairly obvious division between the two sides of the brain and certain in cerebral hemispheres. So that's a clue that you've got some lateralization going on as well. You've got lots and lots of surface area through all this folding. And uh, one thing you can do, I'm going to do it in a bit I've cut up already, is you can do a surface scrape and you can scrape off um, some of the grey matter um, from the surface. Let's do it here. You just see essentially you're peeling the grey matter off and you get to white matter underneath quite quickly. So that's suggesting to you that the grey matter is quite important. You know that you've got even more folding on a human brain and you've got more processing power, if you like, with a human brain. The folding gives you more space for more grey matter. So that's a pretty good sign that the grey matter is important. So you've got a bit of logic there, a bit of how science works. One of the other things I suggest you can do with a brain that's different from a straightforward anatomical dissection is a bit of psychosurgery. So we've done one bit of psychosurgery already, actually. When we cut the brain in two, we cut through the corpus callosum here. And that's what Sperry did with his split brain patients. So he cut through that, made the same sort of incision I did, cut through the corpus callosum, um, split the two cerebral hemispheres apart, and then looked at the effects that had on his patients. So that's one bit of psychosurgery we've done. Another bit of psychosurgery you might think about doing is Phineas Gage's accident. So Phineas Gage rammed a metal rod through the front of his brain in an explosion. It went through the front of the left hemisphere and emerged through the front of the right hemisphere, pretty much like that. 
then you can get your students to think about what effect that had, what that's telling you about what the frontal lobe did, and then go on from Phineas Gage and talk about frontal lobotomies. This is effectively what a frontal lobotomy does. Talk about the effects that that has on patients. And, and then uh, another thing that's worth getting some of your students to do is to think about the motor cortex. It's not quite so easy to spot in a sheep's brain, but the motor cortex is in the strip around here. And then the somatocentric cortex is in a strip around here. So you could get them to talk about, predict the effects that you would have by electrical, or in this case, mechanical stimulation of different parts of the motor or the somatosensory cortexes, what this sheep would be feeling uh, or the movements you might induce by stimulation there. And then you can do other bits of psychosurgery as well. You could get your students to, um, to locate where Broca's area would be. If I was in the right, if I was in the correct cortex on the left side, it'd be about here or Wernicke's area back here, and things like that. So lots of other bits of psychosurgery. You don't have to just do an anatomical dissection. Get the most out of it. It's worth every penny.